All right, everyone, we'll be starting the, uh, the next presentation shortly. If you'll take your seats. All right, so our next speaker is Stephen Goodwin. He's a vice president at the Henry Jackson Foundation, uh, works closely with a number of, of different groups, um, and has had a kind of interesting path um, to varying um, and expanding uh, uses of, of LabP server. Um, and uh, I'd like to welcome him. Thanks, Josh. I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, on behalf of my team, I want to thank everybody at LabKey. Uh, they've been a fantastic partner. Uh, what I want to tell you here is a little story about who we are, uh, what we do, and sort of the crazy sequence of events that brought us into this room. Again, we're new to LabKey, so we're learning, and it's, it's really been a fantastic experience already to meet people and see what's going on. Uh, so first of all, um, who we are, it's really interesting. Uh, we are the Henry M. Jackson Foundation. We're known as hjf.org. We are a private, not-for-profit organization. We were founded by Congress uh, back in 1983, and we serve military medicine, so military medicine, and specifically, we're also related to the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. So that is a mouthful. Uh, they know themselves as USIS, uh, USU, uh, our nation's medical school. Uh, if I go to somebody on the street and I tell them, do you know the United States government runs a degree-granting medical school, most people will tell me I am crazy, just patently crazy. But they do. And it was founded in 1972, and it's a fantastic and interesting organization. Um, their, their big purpose for existence is to create a field of expertise and a catchment for knowledge of the kinds of medicine that interests the military. And they've been fantastically successful in that, and their, their alumni are, are very well regarded and uh, they're deployed around the world for us today. Um, the other thing that is really interesting about what we do is the blank stare that I get when I tell somebody that we're involved in military medical research. I, I, I can't tell you how many times, I mean, Ms. Manner says that you should never ask people what they do, but I live in Washington, D.C., which, by the way, I understand the government is still funded. Is that not true? So within eight hours of the government, today's the 1st of October, in case anybody's not watching, how many people know what that means in government money speak? How many people get, have to deal with government money speak in the room? I mean, is it, it's not just me, right? Okay, so eight hours before the deadline, we extended the game until the 11th of December, I understand. But in any event, if, if Ms. Manner says, you know, it's not polite to ask people what they do, but they always do. And when you tell them you're involved in military medical research, some of them will start openly snickering because it just seems implausible to them. But military medical research is, is, is fantastic in enterprise. And I like to remind people about the breadth and the depth of military medicine and medical research. It goes all the way from just common sense tactics when people are fighting in war. Uh, better armor, better tactics, avoid getting hurt, duh. And when people think of military medical research, they usually think of shock, trauma, and resuscitative medicine, which of course are huge, huge fields in military medicine and very interesting, obviously, to this day. Uh, in, the, in the current conflicts that we've been we've been engaged in. And if you think about it, we've been engaged now for almost 15 years. So if you step back and look at this, it's really a pretty phenomenal circumstance in our nation's history. Uh, we have people who are suffering from head injuries. We have people suffering from limb amputations. In both cases, uh, there's some very interesting things that are going on. Head injuries and, and the amputations coming off the battlefield are both successes of the people who do uh, shock trauma resuscitative medicine. In other words, in previous conflicts, these people would have died on the battlefield. Now they're brought off the battlefield. So then becomes a long process, a long story for the rest of their lives where they'll be cared for. Now, the, the, the head injury also has some other classic overlays in civilian society. Can anybody think of, of where does head injury is, is of interest in, in the modern American universe? You got it. You got it. So the same people, and this is really fascinating, it just shows you how military medicine falls across. The same people who are instrumenting soldiers to understand blast uh, and, and try to measure impact and potential for injury are also now putting devices into helmets to understand when somebody's had a head hit, how serious is this head hit, and what should we be doing. I mean, when I was a kid and you hit your head, they would put your football helmet back on you. They would direct you back toward the huddle and, and push you off onto the field. But now, as we now know that repeated head hit is a really bad thing, and there's a refractory period where you want to avoid head injury. Uh, we know a lot better now. But my point being that head injury in military medicine is changing standard of care within the civilian world, and a lot of the head injury research that's gone, over, uh, gone on since Iraq and Afghanistan have also brought forward some advances in that space. 
One of the most interesting ones, just let me say, is how do you tell if somebody's been head injured? I mean, everybody looks at me like, yeah, you're crazy. If you have a piece of shrapnel sticking out of your head, you're head injured, right? But if you're a football player, are you head injured? Or if you're a troop who's been subject to a blast, are you head injured? So some of very interesting science going on now is to determine, you know, how are people head injured? That's just one example. Amputees are another example. Who in our world are typically the amputees? Well, they tend to be older people with circulatory problems, but soldiers are not older with circulatory problems. And when they have, when they have an amputation, they want to put their uniform back on, climb a rock wall, play basketball, ride a motorcycle, and go to work. So it's a very different challenge, and it's a really interesting field. But my dad was an artilleryman, but the one thing about war that's very interesting is that most casualties of warfare are not due to bullets, bayonets, and bombs. They're actually due to infectious disease. So it's, it's sort of a dirty little secret of warfare. Infectious disease is the big killer of people. Even in the Syrian conflict that we see now, the numbers are very close. But if you, if you tally up the deaths, it appears that infectious disease is still in the lead. So infectious disease has been something that has fascinated military from the very beginnings of military medicine. And most of our programs, many of our programs, not all of course, are involved in infectious disease. A program that we, they have, uh, your, the previous speaker was talking about prostate disease. And we actually have a program, the Center for Prostate Disease Research, that deals in that space as well. And we're going to talk uh, because <clears throat> we have some potential for, uh, for getting it together there. But on the infectious disease side, that's number one thing that we deal with. So much of the things I'll be talking about today are going to be about infectious disease. But first, a little bit of history, and this is really interesting. Um, anybody recognize this guy in the slide? Anybody from the state of Washington recognize this guy in the slide? Henry Scoop Jackson, right? So he was, he was really well regarded in, in Congress. Very interesting guy. He spent almost his entire career in the Congress. He came, I believe, as a 29-year-old into office and later died as a senator. He was one of the ones who actually put our legislation in place that gave birth to the foundation. And we were to be named the Foundation for the Advancement of Military Medicine. And again, our existence is so that we can help military medical researchers collaborate and accomplish research uh, in, in their field. And when Henry died, we were named in his honor. So we became the Henry M. Jackson Foundation. And I always tell our employees, this is incredible. It will never fit on a piece of paper or any form you will ever figure out, right? Our full name, according to lawyers, is the Henry M. Jackson Foundation for the Advancement of Military Medicine Incorporated. And say that three times quickly. So we like to be known as HJF, but, but again, we're named in honor of Henry Scoop Jackson. Now, what's really interesting is if you Google Henry M. Jackson Foundation, you will discover there are two of us. So there's, there's us, who lives on the East Coast and deals with military medical research, and there's his, widow found, his widow's foundation that lives in this town that deals with statecraft uh, and public service. And so there are actually two Henry M. Jackson Foundations. And if that's not enough, right down the street in Bangor, Washington, there's a Ohio-class uh, SSBN 730 USS Henry M. Jackson nuclear submarine, the only Ohio-class submarine not named after a state, this one was to be the Rhode Island, that was named in Scoop's honor. So you're starting to get the sense, Scoop must have been an incredible guy. He also ran for president at one point. So there's two foundations and a nuclear submarine in his name. So I want you to remember that. <coughs> So where do we work? We, we work principally in Washington, D.C. Uh, basically, we were born in the Washington, D.C. area and followed the military across the world. So initially, we followed the military in the, the standard garrison facilities in the U.S., military treatment facilities, research facilities. A lot of people don't know the military actually has overseas sentinel laboratories tracking infectious disease because most infectious disease is not occurring in the Western world, of course. It's occurring outside of the Western world. Uh, we're located at uh, more than 100 locations, 28 states, and 10 foreign countries. As our research programs in infectious disease grew in size and complexity, they have to chase infectious disease. And so they do chase it, and they, they move overseas. So we have people, for instance, in sub-Saharan Africa, we have people in Uganda, uh, South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, and now we have people since the advent of e Ebola, we've had a, a lot of people in, engaged in the fight against Ebola, so now they're moving into Western Africa as well. We have a great tooth to tail ratio, about 90% of our employees are directly engaged in research, and our overhead rate is incredibly uh, reasonable at about 14.5%. So for, I'd, go, I'd like to go ahead and talk about a, our single largest program, and that is the United States Military HIV Research Program. 
uh, a really fascinating program that's been going on for a long, long time. There, how many people in the room have dealt with MHRP? I mean, this is how we've met a lot of, of collaborators here. It's very fascinating. Um, the backstory of this program is just fascinating. Uh, they've been around for a long, long time, and you can see their focus now is on developing a, a vaccine, which is really the great hope in HIV research world that we can actually develop an efficacious vaccine. But the backstory is equally fascinating. So the military HIV research program, in fact, when you ask why is the military involved in HIV research, a lot of people say, yeah, yeah, why, remind me, right? Uh, HIV clearly is a bloodborne infectious disease, so it's interesting to the military on both counts. But really, part of it might be an accident of history. Uh, you have to turn on the way back helmet and think back into the, into the early years of HIV. We've now known about HIV virus for about, what, 31 years? We know an awful lot about HIV virus. We've learned an awful lot about the immune system. We now have five classes, I am told, and I think a six is on the way, of antiretroviral drugs so that we can do a lot about it, you know, given the best available circumstances, the best pharmaceuticals, uh, the best laboratory, and the best infectious disease knowledge. Uh, but we still, can't, we still can't cure the disease, and again, the big hope is a vaccine. So what happened way back then is this program basically found a catchment of people who had HIV, naturally, if you just run the numbers, when, when we first were able to diagnose HIV. This research program was formed way back in the 80s. And I don't know how many people in the room are old enough to remember that, but people were freaking out about HIV disease, right? This program, for instance, we used to have dental chairs in our clinics because no one would let the, the, the patients receive dental care. So, I mean, it was, it was another time, another place. You really had to be there to understand it. And it was, it was a really rough cut early on because the focus was on trying to save the lives of these patients. And the military really got their act together. They had three medical treatment facilities that, that specialized in HIV treatment, one for the Air Force, Wilford Hall in San Antonio, Texas, one for the Army at Wal uh, Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C., and one for the Navy, the National Navy Medical Center, NNMC, also in Bethesda, Maryland, Washington, D.C., Area. And they did the best they can to, to follow these patients. It turned out they were the single largest cohort. My understanding is that they were the single largest cohort uh, following the natural history of the disease outside of the Gay Men's Health Caucus in San Francisco, California. They were among the longest lived early patients, HIV patients, and, and it's, it's just an amazing testimony to the, the researchers and the patients. To this day, although I understand it's fallen out of favor because of the expense, the Walter Reed staging uh, is, is one of the ways that you stage HIV infection. So that's this program that we're talking about. A lot of people don't remember the old part of the program, and that was it. So it was looking at diagnostics. It was trying to understand the natural history of HIV disease. Now, of course, their main focus is finding a vaccine uh, to help us out of HIV disease. And their focus is on the clades or variations of the HIV virus outside of North America and Europe. So again, why HIV in the military? The backstory, I think, kind of tells the story. That's how they got involved. But as a bloodborne illness and from a humanitarian standpoint and also from a, a, a stability standpoint, HIV has become a huge deal. I mean, there are countries where there's almost no HIV prevalence, right? But there are countries where more than 10% of the population is seropositive. And these are not countries, you know, that typically have the resources to treat it. In the United States of America, I have to say, we're a little bit asleep at the wheel. If you ask people in the street about HIV disease, they think it's a disease of gay men and IV drug abusers, which it is because of the potential for blood-to-blood -blood contact. But it's much bigger than that. And the predominant mode of transmission, of course, worldwide is heterosexual contact, which is pretty inevitable if you uh, think as I do. So MHRP is a program now who's focused on the vaccine, and they're worldwide. So it's really fascinating. So they, they actually have international research infrastructure, clinical trial capabilities, f again, fundamentally uh, in, in Africa at this point, but also in Thailand. How many people in the room remember RV-144? So MHRP, and there are a lot of people in this room that are actually work, have worked on RV-144 or are working on follow-on studies to RV-144. So this is a great example of the com crazy complex quilt that we live in. RV-144 was one of the last, not the last, but one of the last phase three vaccine trials in the HIV world. And it, it was a collaboration between the United States government, both the Department of the Army, the National Institutes of, of, of Health, uh, the Thai Ministry of Health, uh, the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research and the Henry M. Jackson Foundation to, to deliver a vaccine to 16,000 plus volunteers in Thailand. And it was, it was actually a vaccine crafted from two previous vaccines that had failed. 
And it started out in 2003, I believe it ran till 2006. The results were announced, I think, in 2010. It was controversial the whole time. It was an amazing international effort. But against all odds, the vaccine actually was marginally efficacious. So it really spun off a, a new understanding of the challenge and a new understanding of the possibilities in HIV vaccine world. So Thailand is still an active research site and Asia is an active research site also. But again, in Africa, you can see we have people, as I've mentioned, in Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, uh, Nigeria. Also, very interesting about this program is PEPFAR. Anybody in the room ever heard of PEPFAR? It, uh, it's amazing. It, it, PEPFAR is a phenomenal program started by George Bush. It's the president's emergency plan for AIDS. A former leader of this program is now Ambassador Debbie Burks, Dr. Debbie Burks, who for many years served as the commander of, of this program, is actually the ambassador in charge of the uh, delivery of PEPFAR program. So it's actually an interesting relationship to this program themselves. And PEPFAR, of course, delivers treatment. And these guys were one of the early people that realized if you're going to out people have, having HIV, that is, if you're going to test them and tell them about HIV, you have to give them hope, right? Otherwise, you just can't do it. So they combined research with care. And now, as PEPFAR has evolved, there's a lot of, of PEPFAR activity. And in terms of uh, dollar value, PEPFAR is, is a higher, higher dollar activity uh, than actually the research itself, which is actually kind of interesting and ironic. So how do we get here? How did I show up on this stage? It's an accident, total accident of history. And it, it really began outside of LabKey and outside of the MHRP lab with one of their subgroups who was actually uh, implementing a laboratory information management system. Um, I have to say that the, the researchers are characterized by the fact that they're very bright and they're very impatient, and the information systems resources that they have tend to be distributed into the work groups. Um, but we had one researcher who realized she had a problem, and that was the neutralizing antibody assay, uh, Shelley Krebs, and she deserves a lot of credit for our being in this room. She she realized that the, the way that they were doing this assay was just really labor intensive and it was uh, prone to error. They were using um, my nemesis, <coughs> Microsoft Excel. Uh, but in, in, in any event, she realized she had a problem and she actually went into the program to the people who were the computer and analytic people. And this is interesting. It's part of the reason I like to, to be here to help everybody understand our, our journey is that these people deal in clinical trials and they deal in statistics and they deal in data management. And she, she went to these people and she said, well, can you help me with this assay? And they looked at her like she had three eyes. Because laboratory instrument, assay, no. We do CRFs, right? It was a very different universe. So she started working with these people, didn't work. And so finally, she found you guys. And is this, is this something, is this an article, a shill, or how did this happen? I mean, anyway. She found you guys on the web. And uh, sure enough, she actually had the courage to call and ask for help. She called and contacted you. And, and this is what really stands out for me about LabKey. I deal with a lot of software, a lot of implementations, uh, ERP systems, crazy stuff like that. I recommend against that. I heard a great joke the other day about uh, what if uh, the, what is it, the Death Star from, from uh, Star Wars sh showed up over Earth? You know, how can we defend ourselves against it? And the recommendation was to send up an SAP sales team. And <laughs> And within four years, the empire would be brought to their knees. But there's some truth in that. I deal with Oracle. But in any event, Dr. Krebs not only f contacted LabKey, but was able to work with LabKey. They spoke her language, which is interesting and a lesson for us. And, and they were able to very quickly demonstrate that LabKey worked. The neutralizing antibody assay that they already had worked and that they could demonstrate that, hey, perhaps we could even change it to fit your assay. And of course, that excited Shelley a lot. But the one thing I want to say here is, right away is that software like LabKey was, was an anomaly. It was an anomaly. And I say here, just uh, somebody said out of the box earlier. <clears throat> that can happen. Out of the box sometimes does happen. But I would call it some assembly required, right? So that in science, it's always going to be that you want one more thing, right? So this was a new thing to Shelley, and it was a new thing to the program. Her own people really couldn't deal with it. She needed to ask for help. So she asked for outside help, and we were on our way. So I have to say I'm very impressed with LabKey's professional services and their ability to deliver for Shelley. They got on the job. They were able to speak her language and vice versa. And we really had no resources inside of our organization to assist. Again, our resources were deployed within the programs, and our other resources were committed. So we weren't really able to help. But in very short order, 
they were able to modify the assay. I mean, I think really the work took about six weeks, the fundamental work. Um, a lot of it was just trying to understand and communicate back and forth with Shelley so that we could all speak the same language. Because scientists, as smart as they are, don't speak the same language that as smart as they are, the computers people speak. And they, it's really an amazing thing. So LabKey brings them both together. So they modified the, the assay to give us a 384 well plate and run two viruses on, on a single plate. Um, they also invented a new import format, new export utility, and voila, Shelley and crew were on their way. Now, interestingly, we had a little bit of problem because they were on their way in the LabKey hosted instance. Uh, so we had to uh, sort of scramble in order to bring the system up internally, and then LabKey helped us move it back inside, and that, you know, that's where this uh, now lives today. But it was fantastic success, and I have to say this is an example of transforming your operations. So this is what I'm calling like line of business laboratory. So you took something that was, it was error prone and manpower intensive, and we turned it into a workflow, and it just really changed the possibilities for this group. And Shelley is working on some out front sort of issues. Uh, it'll, change the, it'll change the possibilities for the follow on groups that are doing this kind of assay in, in greater numbers. So it's a fantastic experience. But really, this is only the beginning, and, and it showed to us right away that Houston, you do have a problem. Uh, the very first thing that happened is that boom, transformation for her, uh, for her group. The second thing that happened is immediately she had buyer's remorse, right? Buyer's remorse. She looked at what she'd done and she says, well, wait a minute. If this works so nicely, why didn't I do that one more thing? One more thing. So we started, we started to work with it to try to track back that one more thing. And on the right of the slide here, I sort of have some things that live in our universe and I'm sure live in all of your universes. So the instruments are knocking out files. They may be proprietary format or actually data files. Text files are plentiful and always present. Excel, uh, don't want to say too much about Excel, but it's a great product, couldn't do without it. One of the uh, LabKey people is married to someone who's involved in, in building Excel, so I will we'll have words about that. But there's one more product that I, I'd like to say we use very often, and we found it to be a really good product. Uh, FileMaker, is anybody, does anybody, show of hands, has anybody ever used FileMaker? Fantastic, pro it was a really weird piece of software. Started way back a long time ago, a company named Nashoba got bought by Apple. They called it Claris, then they confused everybody. It's basically a database uh, environment that can be used as a client-server environment. It runs on both Macs and PCs, and it really allows the researchers to do a lot for themselves. So in our universe, the, the more able researchers have sort of moved into that space, and they've built a lot of automation for themselves, which now, of course, causes us more trouble, because as we start breaking into bedrock there and taking the pipes out, so like plumbing, you realize, yeah, we're going to we're gonna have to work on some more things. But wh what we found is that in different laboratories, there were many levels of need and many levels of, of uh, many levels of laboratory automation and workflow that were already going on. Some of them had to do with the nature of the science. Some had to do with the nature of the people. Some had to do with just history. We don't really know why it got the way it got, but really fascinating. So this boundaries of automation thing, I think, is huge in the laboratory science world. At least that's what I'm perceiving. And I have to remind you, I'm not a scientist and I, I'm, I'm not a uh, developer. I'm just kind of a computer guy. In fact, uh, I used to be the vice president of HR which is really, really kind of funny stuff. I had HR in my group because that's like Dilbert, right? You know, luckily we've grown out of that. We've gotten bigger and I'm no longer in that role. Uh, but most of my stuff is, is computers. So what happened then after Shelley's success is we had some evangelism going on, which we like. We like because normally if you're trying to come to the person and tell them we're going to implement a system for you, they're like, right. You know, they're not anxious to get systems implemented because anybody who's been through one knows exactly what that means. Uh, but, but the evangelism did genuinely take hold. People start who before weren't looking at this because Shelley had succeeded and the LabKey guys were for real, right? They're, they're dudes. They're out there on the left coast and they really helped her out. Um, they, they actually started getting interested in this product. And, and I have to say, it really caused a flurry of interest. But, and, and, they, and everybody agreed, hey, there's a lot of potential there. But hey, after you've proven it over here, you can come mess with me. It's like, okay, okay, okay. And then what happened at the bottom of the slide is somebody else took notice on this, this whole thing. So besides looking at laboratory workflows, where we think that's obviously why LabKey is here, right? Laboratory workflows. The other people took an interest, and I don't have the correct slide here, but they watched your video, people, okay? So do you remember the video? You guys have a video? I think there's a video, like a very brief video about how LabKey works. The people who ran the program saw this video, and, and it, it was good, it was good. The, the, the marketing people here should be very excited. So they saw the potential of using LabKey as sort of an integration program for this wild and crazy thing known as MHRP. And as soon as they saw that, since they're the program leadership, um, we started getting interested in the problems that they were bringing to our attention, which is, why don't we use this to sort of bring to a central dashboard all the information about all of our protocols and studies? 
And so that's what we've begun to do. And I want to back up a little bit and remind everybody that they're operating overseas. So they're operating in all these places overseas. And actually part of the mission is not just to do research where infectious disease, disease lives, but to build platforms and capabilities in the countries. So they genuinely go into countries and teach people laboratory science. They get CAP, uh, you know, CAP certified. They teach, people, uh, they teach people how to do clinical research. They're teaching, teaching, teaching. So it's a big, big effort. But a lot of challenges happen when you start to do multi-site trials that involve multiple developing countries in multiple time zones and multiple cultures. And, and we suffer from all of those or are, are advantaged by all of them, however you look at them. I have to say some of the best science and the best collaboration that I've ever seen have come out of these, these kind of places. And so in spite of the conditions, people can do amazing things. And given, you know, given the right motivation and capabilities, they do. But one of them, and this is a term I bring to you from Africa, Actually, I think it's UK. Is there UK in the room, please? ICT, is ICT? Sorry. No? OK. Information Communications Technology. That's, when I went there, that's what they called it. When I went to South Africa, I remember the first thing I did, I'm an infrastructure guy, is I arrived to set up networking for a group. And they say, where are the routers? And I'm like, routers? Oh, Cisco. OK, router, router. We call those routers. No, we call those routers. And they called stoplights robots in South Africa. So anyway, I learned a lot. but. Uh, but yeah, ICT. So one of the big challenges that shaped the program's information capabilities was information technology. And I just have really badly, my, my communications people took a look at this slide and they gagged me with a spoon. They didn't want to talk about it. They say this is not a good slide visually. But I want to say that initially our, our communications were incredibly limited. They were a rate limiting factor for doing science. I, in the early days in Thailand, we used to communicate via email using modems. Does anybody here remember a modem? Right, I'm seeing some older people, right? That singing song dance that goes on, and, and, and sometimes there won't be enough time in the night for the modems to, to transmit all the mail and, and files back and forth. So we, we started way back there. Then things started to get better, right? So in Thailand, Thailand's rock and roll, right? Thailand is 100% digitized. Africa, not so much, but it's happening very quickly. So we had terrestrial connections. Finally, we ponied up and we bought satellite communications, which is pretty amazing because you can drop a satellite communication almost everywhere. Turns out we had a couple troubles. The first one is that the satellite antennas are big. And, and where we were, where the satellites we were aiming at were low. And, and the other thing that went on is we were conducting a war in the Middle East. And guess who's renting all the satellite capacity? So it was a big challenge, but we did get that satellite network out there. And the big challenge there now wasn't connectivity. It was truly bandwidth and sunspots. You know, we learned a little bit about sunspots. We also learned about all kinds of things that goes on when dishes become not aimed. It's many things you never want to know, but it was fun. It was fun. But finally now, we've got better terrestrial communication. So in Africa now, it's pretty much there. It's amazing. Don't let them mess with you. There's plenty of connectivity out there. And there's some fiber cable coming into the west coast of Africa. It's really coming up. There are a lot of trouble getting uh, things uh, different places. There's still people stealing copper cable. You know, there's all kinds of terrestrial issues. But I want to say the one thing overseas that's fantastic and, and that I learned from going overseas is cellular and mobility. So in these developing countries, they just skipped right on past the copper wire phase. And they've all moved to cell phones. And people don't carry cash. They, they, they use cell phones, for, they use SMS for just about everything, right? So it's amazing what you can do with a cell phone. You just didn't know it because you never had to do it. So when we think of a cell phone, it's not even a cell phone anymore, right? It's a computer that you carry around. Remember, it has more compute power, everybody in this room, than, than uh, the space shuttle. I don't even have to go back to Apollo, right? I just have to go back to the space shuttle. I don't know, remember the five voting computers? I mean, they're pretty low blow computers, but highly reliable and I'm sure quite expensive. But in any event, you can see that kind of environment has set us up for some, some interesting states. One of them is that many of our systems were isolated. So by the nature of the business, going out and inventing a, a, a capacity, we had to have an isolated system. And it tended to be a clone, but I will say, it tended to be an imperfect clone of other systems. Um, the other thing is that interactive applications, even in the modern world, can suffer from reliability issues. So the cloud, you know, or central hosting, or having one tr source of truth, these are all really good things to go after. But if you're trying to verify that you can actually do a data run and put data up today, now, in the next 15 minutes, I can't necessarily guarantee that, right? Can't necessarily guarantee that. So there's this intermittent episodic connectivity still. Now, what's come on is a lot of people are demanding offline computing with an uplink. So that's the thing. Is anybody else getting that thing going? This is the kind of stuff we're really seeing a lot of pressure for. Offline computing with an uplink and mobile devices. 
So what's happening, mobile devices, not only because you don't necessarily need real-time uplink, but also because they want to go do medicine out there in really remote places, or they want to have teams move around and interview people, and they want to bring back information with mobile devices. So we're seeing a lot of pressure on this front. But that's, that's something to think about here. Now, where we are now, I mentioned we've tried to bring back, and, and so you can think about this. The, the reason I talked about overseas a little bit is to remind you that, uh, by the way, I have to say, they, they invented a name for the, this, the oh, I hate to use the word portal, but they invented a name for this portal called the Walter Reed Portal, Warp. And I asked them, is that the best logo that you can come up with? But given the name, right? We have a lot of Star Trek fans in, in, in the audience. But, but in any event, they, they've got a name for this internal portal. And remember, it's a portal to try to help surface information about their studies, the supporting information. And you'll notice the three sites up here, site, 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 sort of to bring back and aggregate the clinical data, the laboratory data. Uh, and, 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 and then here's the other thing, the related research data. Their main research laboratories are in Bethesda, Maryland and Forest Glen, Maryland. So that, that's where they do their main research. And they've got to bring it all together by seeing the stuff that's coming in from the sites, seeing the specimens, bringing stuff back, and coordinating the whole exercise. So they've got a distributed system out there. So this is an internal portal. And the graph that we have on the right was like the money shot graph. Uh, when we were able to show this to the researchers, they, they stopped the meeting. It was just amazing. I mean, it was kind of the end of the meeting. You know, it was one of these meetings where we say, why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? Why can't you do this? And so we came back to the next meeting and we showed them a participant's uh, CD4 count and, and their viral burden over time from the time that they were first brought up as HIV positive uh, through, you can see the advent of antiretroviral therapy on one page and they could do that for any patient instantaneously. And that was a revolutionary thing for them. And it's actually one of the strengths of LabKey because we're able to do this. Nikat Zafar was able to do this for us pretty quickly actually I would say and they were just shocked so this this value of this central dashboard is huge and that's what we're after now at the expense I might say of the Shelley Krebses of the world here's another use of lab key within our space now for something completely different we have a group that deals with assays again early in the program remember finding how to detect HIV was a big deal so they they're still doing assays associated with detecting HIV and they also get involved with assays with other things. For instance, they were involved in the Ebola uh, outbreak where they had to validate whether or not the Ebola detection was actually adequate and working, same group. And so they're actually a diagnostic group. They're running a laboratory information management system. Um, and we needed a way to get a portal in front of that, a web front end in front of that. So they're distributed customers and they have hundreds of customers around the country who are related to the military, National Guard, reservists, et cetera, who have to ask them to do a validation of a, of a specimen. You know, I have to ask them to confirm an HIV diagnosis. So we worked with LabKey Services to build a secure front run end. And again, the focus being here on, on secure because the, the data that we're putting into this is, is identifiable because they're actually asking for a specific patient with a social, et cetera, to get a test. And they promised to send us a tube of blood the next morning. Or actually, is it blood or serum? I don't recall. Somebody will have to correct me. But the idea was to go in there and, and request the test, retrieve the results uh, secure. By the way, I don't know if you noticed this, it's really scary. Lab key logo, lab wear logo. This is Erlenmeyer stuff or something, right? I don't know where, where you guys, no relationship, right? <clears throat> so the, the whole application design, again, very, very rapid, uh, but also in, emphasizing security the whole time. We have a brief period where we're catching this scary data and then we're pushing it back into the laboratory system. We're then deleting it after it's been there for a short time, only long enough for us to do this little dance to exchange the results, which is going to typically be in, in a single or I'd say like a three-day work period. Uh, and, and then we also worked with a simple user interface. It didn't start out so simple and it may not end so simply, but we worked together very quickly to come up with a way to ask for different tests for different patients most of the tests have to do with HIV, what they call, I don't know if you can read this, but the HIV screening algorithm, which is actually a really nice uh, screening algorithm, um, to request your specimen. It turns out there's a lot to it. it, it, it as software development often is, you start peeling the onion, right? It keeps going. But we want to be able to ask for the test, then we want to be able to retrieve the result, and we want them to be able to tell us the FedEx or whatever carrier it is, shipping information so that when it shows up and pops in our system, it's already in the, in the internal limb system, and we go from there. And it's uh, very exciting. Now, security is also a huge deal here. And so we felt it necessary to put in place two-factor authentication. So two-factor authentication, of course, is becoming very popular. And, and it, it helps us defend against attacks because in order to authenticate, you've got to know more than just your username and the password. You've got to know your username, your password, and then you've got to possess something. So we figured, and this is naively as it turns out, <clears throat> we figured that this would not be a problem 
Everybody has a smartphone. I see several people looking at theirs now. So in any event, we, 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 we actually got with LabKey, and, and they were very good about this. They helped us out real quickly. We had looked out at the firmament of who was in that space. They looked at the people that were in that space, and our number one and one of their three, I think we gave us three, uh, was Duo Security. And I don't want to put in a plug for Duo, but we'd already been using them because we'd found them useful for a lot of different, they'd already built a lot of uh, integrations for a lot of commercial products that are out there, VPNs, Citrix, you can name them out there. And, and the way it works is that um, they offer you several ways to come back. It can either come back to your cell phone as an application if you have a smartphone, Android or iPhone. It can actually send you an app SMS message. It can call you on your office phone. And you just push any key to say, yeah, that's really me, people. Um, and it, it's, it's a really nice product. But it has its own challenges, and we're still discovering them um, in, in both the software world, but also just getting people to use it and, and, and keep them on it. So it's actually quite fascinating. And I'd love to answer questions about that if people have any questions. I do think in our world, this two-factor thing is going to become standard of practice. I mean, uh, we, we oftentimes uh, IP restrict space that we'll talk with. But going in the future, if you have to go out there and you have to be able to hit by anybody, you're going to have to make sure you've got every step in place. And two-factor, I think, is going to be a, a real common one. So in summary, on, on, lab, on lab key and MHRP, uh, what we're really hoping to do is to get to the lab, laboratory workflows within the domestic lab space principally. Remember, those are the big researchers like Shelley Krebs and, Krebs and crew, and help them work through and optimize their universe, and in the process, help us discover better ways to help them do science and perform their mission. Uh, the second thing is this integrated overview of this crazy program information that's out there, and we're already, again, working on that. We're working on both of these in parallel. Uh, finally, we're really excited about using LabKey for overseas sites because as our connectivity has improved to the point where we may not be able to trust interactive real-time kind of uh, uh, operations or applications, we can definitely have the labs in the field just use LabKey and upload stuff to LabKey to bring it back to a central place to agree upon it, to analyze it, and to facilitate the collaborations. Um, what sort of challenges are we facing? I think these are the challenges all of you are facing. And for me, it's been a real cultural, uh, very, very interesting journey. I mean, a lot of it has to do with learning, adoption curves, standardization, coordinating, staffing. So when we found this product, we didn't have these things in place. We were distributed force. Um, you know, we talked about this last night at the party. Oftentimes, if you want to get everybody to do, to do something the same way, and you have six groups doing it, it's a sales job. And, and many of these people are going to look at you like, right, you know, I could do that for you or not. You know, but, but anyway, the, the value is to the enterprise. The value is not to the individual work group. So it's just like ERP system. The value is to the enterprise. It's really a line of business system. And finally, we hope uh, at some point in time to open this up to external collaborators to facilitate, uh, uh, to facilitate science communication. Now, I've got a different program that I want to talk about now just because, just to show you the weird universe that we live in. Um, this one is sponsored by the Navy. MHRP is, is an Army program, fundamentally. Um, but this one is sponsored by the Navy. And it's called a CASO. And it's a, it's a mouthful, people. Austere Environment Consortium for Enhanced Sepsis Outcomes. It's a good one. You notice the E is not capitalized. And even more, there's a pun here. Because a CASO was a Greek goddess. Now, I didn't know that when they first gave me the name. So I'm thinking, well, why did you name it this? But in any event, sepsis. Let's talk about sepsis. Why is the military interested in sepsis? What is sepsis? How many people even know about sepsis in this room? I mean, you know, it's, it's really mean. Basically, in sepsis, your body kills you, which is, is quite fascinating. So, you know, sepsis is a bloodstream infection. It's typically triggered by some alien that's inside of you. It could be virus. It could be, it could be a bacteria. It could be a parasite. It could be fungus. It could be any kind of thing. But you, you have an overwhelming response. You go into septic shock. And if you actually get to the point of going into septic shock, you are hurting. So your, your chances of dying are very high. So I, I don't know the precise figures, but they're you know, 30 40% or even higher. It's actually a leading cause of mortality both in the United States and in developing countries. But it turns out that the patient bases are different. In the United States, septic shock victims tend to be older people toward end of life oftentimes, iatrogenic illnesses in a hospital. In a developing world, they tend to be young, vigorous people who, for instance, are out in a rice paddy and cut their ankle and then show up in the hospital and because of their robust immune response, you know, they fall victim to sepsis. Now, why is the military interested in this? Well, first of all, from a humanitarian standpoint, this is a no-brainer. From a military standpoint, we travel and deal in these places where you could be young, walking through that rice paddy, and find yourself in septic shock. Also, and this is interesting, I didn't realize this, they tell me that more than 10% of our multi-trauma victims in military space, that's somebody who's, you know, trauma wound, overlays with septic shock. So there's like this, this natural interest.
And so what these guys are trying to do is they're trying to improve outcomes for adult patients. They're trying to make more people survive sepsis. And they want to do that by very quickly characterizing the disease. On the last slide I mentioned, in our world, these are in, in, in intensive care units. In the developed world, you don't have an intensive care unit, right? So they've got to find ways quickly to triage and understand what they're looking at. They're working on some very esoteric laboratories to come up with biomarkers to predict you know, the, the outcome and, and, and the likelihood of different events in sepsis. And then finally, trying to, to actually do evidence-based clinical management for the individual patients. Once again, this is an alphabet soup of crazy all over the world, right? So this is NMRC, the Naval Medical Research Command, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories, American universities, a couple in the US, uh, Ugandan universities, um, US medical laboratories, NAMRU, I don't know if you've ever heard that, Navy Medical Laboratory units, in Egypt, Cambodia, and West Africa. So you can see the world that we live in here. Once again, it's these widespread collaborations and all these sites going on to focus on infectious disease. So how are we going to use LabKey for them? We caught them early. They found us early. And, and, and we're really hopeful that we can quickly help them get things aligned. So initially, we're doing nothing more than to try to help them aggregate their clinical and laboratory data from all their program sites. Well, that seems like it would be an easy thing, right? Well, wait a minute. I said Cambodia. I said Egypt. I said West Africa. I said Duke University, right? So it's, it's, there's just all kinds of cultural issues going on here. I, I should say the Department of Veterans Affairs. But there are all kinds of things going on. Again, in the U.S., sepsis patients are different than ones overseas. But a lot of the biology turns out to be the same. Pretty interesting stuff. Follow on, of course, is for us to dive deeper, help them automate some of their QC processes, actually automate some of their laboratory aggregation of, of laboratory data. And finally, the possibilities are huge for reporting. I see the, the two people that have shown up so far have been really showing off the reporting capabilities of LabKey. Again, their future is also more than sepsis. It's really interesting. People realize, hey, you have these really smart medical people running around the world doing laboratory tests that are esoteric, talking to people in the clinic, applying treatment. People love us. Why don't we do something else with you? So that's what's coming next. And these guys are going to be moving into Western Africa, and we're going to be following them and trying to help them do business in, in that space. So just really quickly, some of the trends that we're seeing in our space, and I think all of you are seeing these same trends, and that is in the clinical data world. One of our problems, and one of the reasons that I'm here in this room, is that the traditional people who did on this business dealt with CRFs. Do you remember that? Anybody remember a CRF? Right? Piece of paper, ink, all that kind of nice stuff, right? And then double data entry, right? Double data entry, central data entry facility. I mean, everybody remember this? We're kind of optimized for something that just isn't happening anymore, right? Sort of the gold standard. But guess what? You know, the information revolution has occurred, and clinical trials are going to have to follow on. So I think what we're seeing, and we're seeing this in the Western world, we're also seeing some of the demand accelerated in the, in the, uh, in, in the outside third world. I hate to use that expression, but in the developing countries, because they're saying, well, why not? Why not? You know, I have this cell phone. Why not? Why not do, do this survey right now? Why not? Send it right back and do it. And the answer is because our people know about paper and double data entry, right? So not a good answer. So we have electronic CRFs happening. How many people are already using electronic CRFs? There's a work group about that. Yeah, not that many. It's kind of interesting. And, but maybe because we're in a lab space. And then I don't know what to call these guys, MRFs or something? Mobile electronic CRFs. And we actually have several programs now in our space that are working with this. So they're taking tablets out into the world, and they're using these tablets now to enter the data. And it turns out it's really interesting. The software came to us from the world of mobility like the gas line is broken, right? I'm serious. Or, or the people who are, are mobile electricians. Have you ever gotten that where they come to your house and charge? Or plumber, right? Plumber can make, what, $500 in 45 minutes. I think it's actually a pretty remunerative profession. And, and it's hard to outsource. But in any event, they use software. And we picked up some of the software commercially. But we're out there now looking for better software. Because their software, guess what? Doesn't work with QA. Doesn't work with following you know, the, the, the data life cycle of managing the data. But anyway, this mobile CRF is happening. Then the other thing, raw data. Like even the Acaso people are a great example. They're now tapping into raw data. So you might have somebody come in. And then you're taking raw data associated with that event. And you've got to somehow manage this data. You don't know how you're going to analyze it now, but you know you want to capture it and characterize it, and you've got to manage it. So, so you know, th these old paper-based systems just don't happen. And finally, Fitbit, somebody mentioned Fitbit, wearables are happening, right? So some early military research, for instance, we had light, what was called a life vest that you could put in soldiers. It's kind of like, has anybody seen Alien? Remember that? So, so you can tell one of your troops is injured or, or wounded, and you could put it on wounded and tell it. But now, hey, we're going to be wearing watches pretty soon that do all that kind of stuff. So there's going to be a stream of data that's out there. We just got to figure out how to cope with it. And laboratory data is the same way. It's super scary stuff, right? It started out back in the old days where we had a very simplistic ASCII text lab result. 
And now we've moved volume and complexity, analytics, collaboration. We've invented a, an entire uh, bio, you know, bioinformatics, and it's, it's in its infancy. So all this stuff, I think, is coming to a theater near you, uh, whether or not you want to participate. So finally, in summary, I would like to say, again, we're very new to the product. We've got a couple of initiatives going on. Um, it provides for us a fantastic, flexible framework. We really like that because our programs all go out and find their own solutions. And this gives us an opportunity, for instance, to, to give them a common solution so that we can recycle and reuse knowledge, right? It's open source model and technologies is very nice. I think open source is here to stay and we're seeing more and more of it show up in science. The community model and the professional services are a very nice combination for us because the community means that you find other people, such as yourselves, in the room that are using the product. We can communicate, we can leverage each other's experience. And the professional services is self-interested. So if they, if they are gonna modify the product, their default setting is to modify the product for you and put it back into the flow for all the customers, which means you have this self-reinforcing thing. It also means their job's a lot harder, by the way. But it, it means that you have this self-reinforcing thing going on. And, and finally, it complements existing applications, which is really nice. It's not threatening to all the people who have their applications, but we find that people start looking at it and they start you know, thinking, maybe I should do something else with this. Um, collaboration, communication are huge, and I think that's something that's it's really going to help us all, and we look forward to that piece of it. And finally, what I'd like to say is it's almost like a line of business product for research labs. So it's really fitting a need that we just don't see. You know, the vendors have a lot of stuff. The LIMS vendors have a lot of big, heavy-end stuff. But in the research world, we just don't see those products. So LabKey for us, you know, is really answering that need. And with that, I'd like to... Uh, to thank the people that have helped us get this far along the way. Uh, first of all, for, and foremost, really, Lab Key Software, these guys really showed up and did the deed uh, and, and were able quickly to figure out who we were and what we were gonna do. I still don't think they knew exactly who we are, but, but we're working on that. Uh, and finally, within MHRP, we would not be here without Shelly Krebs, who was just an astonishingly patient and, and a lot of foresight to realize that she had to ask for help. And when the first people failed her, she went to the second people, who happened to be Lab Key, and then it started the story. Uh, Dr. Leanne Eller has been really helpful with us trying to get uh, the, the program information into the portal, the warp portal that's forming up. Within a, a, a case, so Janice Hepburn, who's a program administrator, has been fantastic. And she early on realized that we had a lot of solutions she was looking for already in house. Finally, within HAFIT services, uh, both Chris and Nikot, who are here with us, uh, who are new, remember we had to start developing this whole capacity to, to support uh, LabKey. Uh, Chris has been here working on, on uh, LabWare limbs implementation uh, for more than uh, just about a year, right, Chris? And uh, that's gone quite well. And Nikat is only about five months with us and uh, learning very quickly the, the LabKey universe. And finally, we couldn't do any of this without all of you in the room because this is public money. And when you look at it, it's government sponsors and collaborators that include the Army, uh, the Navy, the National Institutes of, uh, of, of Health, and particularly NIAID. And with that, I'd like to uh, wrap up and answer questions. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned a little bit about this. The, can you give me a little bit uh, some idea or comments about the size and <coughs> scale of the data you collected and the speed might be also issue. So what did you do with the hardware side, which is um, hosting this kind of software? That's a great question. So the, the, the question is, you know, what about the size of data that we're collecting and, and how are we going to deal with the, the system requirements to, to uh, serve up this data, whether we're hosting it internally or something. Uh, the size of data we don't know yet, to be very frank. So the initial use with the neutralizing antibody assay, the size of the data is actually pretty reasonable. So th that's not going to become a problem. But this discovery, you know, this slide that I showed you, that slide, okay. Uh, we have f serious fractions of petabytes of data out there, but it's, it's a lot of copies of the same thing. So what we found is that scientists are incredibly industrious and they're incredibly impatient and they're incredibly they figure it out on their own and so what they tend to do is when the instrument knocks data out they tend to move that data around and and we keep running out of space on our internal systems just trying to store this data because it shows up disconnected it shows up on copies and in fact one of our hopes with LabKey truly is that once we gain their confidence is we can identify a stream of the data during its service life from the instrument all the way through analysis and archival and we can help them get that so that we can actually know what we're dealing with. But so far, I don't think that that size, all of our servers that we use to support this are virtualized. We use standard industry virtualization techniques um, and we're using LabQ, we're trying to keep it all open source so far. And we don't think that that's gonna be a problem, but we also have some heavier hitter uh, sort of capabilities if we need to employ them. But to be honest, we haven't characterized the lab volume yet. Uh, the traditional CRFs and all that kind of stuff, much less volume, but our, 
our mobile uh, CRFs a lot of volume. Again, the ones that were developed for electric companies and gas companies, because it turns out that they they keep the CRFs or the forms as well as the data. And if you want to roll back time, you, you have to keep every iteration. So every time anybody uploads their information, you have to keep their entire metadata and data, and you have to roll it back, and there's no QA capability. So it, it generates tons of data. So that, that's an interesting one. Other questions about uh, technology or human nature? I mean, if not, I appreciate it. Thanks so much, everybody.